can we share the peace of God with the most people using the resources that we have? In 2019, Holy Word Austin wanted to build on its 50-year tradition of being a robust Word of God ministry in the community, and so we asked that question. We have so many tools and technologies like the internet, so we thought, what if we use the internet to create a community? A community that brings people together around God's Word. What if we use the internet to share the truth that brings real peace with people across the world? Right now, as you're watching this video, other people are watching the same video. And so as you watch, I want to invite you to leave a comment, ask a question, access the digital Bible, or make a prayer request. We want to connect with you, and we want to connect you to Christ with this awesome opportunity. So welcome to the Holy Word Online Experience. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you on the screen soon. the season called Lent. Uh, not every church uh, celebrates or, or necessarily works through the season of Lent, but we do here at Holy Word. Uh, and it's the season, uh, the next six weeks, about six weeks leading up to Good Friday and Easter when we focus a little bit more on the passion of Jesus and his suffering in our place. And what that does is a couple things. One is that when we focus on the suffering of, of, suffering of Christ, we realize that uh, it was our sins that put him there. So it leads us to a deeper, hopefully a deeper repentance of our own sins, but then also a deeper appreciation of just what Jesus went through carrying our sins to the cross. And so again, the next six weeks is that season of Lent leading up to Good Friday and then uh, the resurrection on Easter Sunday. Uh, but with that said, today we actually have a little different thing on the venue uh, Pastor Dan Lightning, who used to be called here to Holy Word, is, uh, is now a missionary for Tell Ministries, a world missionary. Uh, he's here to lead us in worship that's themed on the gospel message and sharing that gospel message uh, with the world and the joy and the responsibility that we all have to do that. So that will be our theme uh, for the worship today, even though we're in the, the season of Lent. So... With that, let's begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We'll open by singing the opening song, and it'll be up on the screen for you. Spread, O oh spread the mighty word. Please stand with me as we confess our sins to God and be assured of his forgiveness. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions I have done what is evil and fail to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. And he has given to us his one and only son, 
to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stay standing for our song of praise. seated. Our first reading for today comes from the book of Romans in the New Testament chapter 10 verses 1 to 15. You'll see them printed out on the screen for you. A couple things just to look for in these verses. First of all, notice the zeal that the Apostle Paul has for his fellow Jews, that they would come to know the gospel and believe in it in their hearts and thus be saved And he does emphasize that, that it's through the proclaiming of the gospel that other people hear that message, that the Spirit creates faith in their hearts and they are believed and are justified, declared righteous before God. Paul says it's not by following the law or the law being proclaimed to us that uh, we become righteous, but it's actually through the gospel. Thus, how beautiful it is, as Paul says, when we and others take the gospel message out into the world so that people can believe and be saved. Follow along as I read to you from Romans chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. He says, the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How, then, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is our first lesson for today. Our second reading is the gospel reading. It comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 1. And in these verses, we see our Lord, Jesus, sharing the message of Christ, the the message of repentance and trust in the good news of Jesus. And we see the fruits of that proclamation with uh, people coming to believe, his first disciples, leaving everything even and following Jesus. Please stand uh, in honor of the words of our Lord and follow along as I I read to you from Mark chapter 1. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. 
The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. As we get ready to to hear the sermon today, let's sing, We All Are One in Mission. Nice to see so many warm bodies in the pew today, or should I say warming bodies. The icicles are melting off of your ears and your noses, and here we are in God's house gathered to hear his word. And today I'm bringing you his word from Jonah chapter 3. My name is Pastor Dan Leitinen. I serve as a missionary for our church body, the Wisconsin Synod, an online uh, teaching and training program in the Bible called Tell Network. Uh, former pastor here at Holy Word, and it's nice to see uh, old friends again uh, from this view. I usually sit in the pew, but now this morning, the pastor's asked me to preach. Think about this. When was the last time you felt something was really unfair? I'm a father of four children under the age of 10, and so a big part of my day is playing referee, and I am the Supreme Court of our household when it comes to fairness, and they will bring their complaints to me or to their mother. You know, you and I are born with this natural ability to uh, sit at a table across from our frenemy, our brother or sister, and when ice cream is served, to notice exactly how much is in their bowl and whether they get one teaspoon more mint chocolate chip ice cream than me, what am I going to say? That's not fair. That's not fair, right? And the same goes if you're a parent of any parent. You'll know of, of, of children, you'll know it goes for the tricycle and it also goes for, well, this is the big one in our household, the screen time, right? The screen time. 
that's not fair. They got more screen time than me. They got more ice cream than me. And here's the thing is, we're born with this natural ability to measure how much somebody else gets versus me, and that continues on into adulthood. We don't lose that. We become more sophisticated. I noticed it this week because I was scrolling through next door, and I thought to myself, wait a second, why do they have water and I don't? And we live in the same city. That's not fair. And why do they have electricity? I was one that had electricity for most of the week. I'm sure people were asking. And I don't. That's not fair. Your crush at high school, they start to talk to another person more than you. That's not fair. Why does she have 10,000 likes on Instagram and Facebook and all she did was post a video about her painting her nails purple last Thursday. I have so much better things to say online and I only have 10 likes. That's not fair. Or why do they get the promotion? You know, I know that he cut corners and he, he, he fibbed with the clients and he's getting a raise this quarter and I put in an honest quarter's work that's not fair. And pastor, he gives hours of counseling to this family, and I can't get 10 minutes of his time. That's not fair. What's worse, something not being fair or your court case not being heard when people around you can't understand about how unfair life has been to you? Or what's even worse is if you feel like God is being unfair to you. And that every time that you bring, his, you bring your case to his court, you feel like he's either not listening to you or he just doesn't care. Have you been in that boat before? If you have, meet Jonah. Jonah had a real problem with God's fairness about how God distributed his love, his grace, about how God dealt with people, good people versus bad people. And that's what this book of Jonah is all about, is about God's fairness. And Jonah is taking God to court. Believe it or not. This morning, I want us to discover when we think about our own life, and then we think about the life of those people around us, our world, that indeed God is not fair but not in the way that you and I might not think that he's fair. God is not fair because for two, two places we'll go this morning. Number one, he is the Lord of patient grace. Number one, he's the Lord of patient grace. And that goes for you and me. And number two, he is the Lord of far-reaching forgiveness. And that's going to change our perspective. If we know that he's the Lord of patient grace in our life, we'll know that he is being the one, he's the one that's sending us to bring forgiveness and patient grace to other people. And that's really at the heart of, of, of what sharing the gospel is all about, is first being, looking into the mirror and saying, God's not been fair with me in, in the way that you haven't thought about, maybe. And then saying, and that's why I'm going out into the world and I'm sharing this message, the message of grace, the message of hope, the message of forgiveness with other people. So listen now to Jonah chapter 3, 1 to 5. And verse 10, it says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring them on them the destruction he had threatened. So unfair. God is our Lord of patient grace, and he is the Lord of far-reaching forgiveness that goes into this town that we're about to talk about called Nineveh. Where is Nineveh? What is Nineveh? 
Nineveh at this time in Bible history were in the Old Testament in about the year 800 BC, so about 800 years before Jesus. And Nineveh is the seat of the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire at this time was the powerhouse that was overtaking nations, um, and they were known for their brutal tactics in war. Uh, Nineveh, the capital city, would be that city where the, the seat of the capital was, where the leaders were, and, and Jonah is called to go to that city to preach repentance. And, and that's really where Jonah has a rub with God. Because if you want to know about Nineveh, Nineveh is, it was, was quoted in, by ancient people in that time as, as being the city full of blood, full of lies, where people stumbled on corpses without number piled up in the street. And they practiced idol worship, which on the surface you might say looks pretty innocent, but if you were a child... I mean, a young child of a parent that worshipped gods like Asher, Anu, Baal, and Ishtar, it was likely that you would be thrown into fire and sacrificed. Because they practiced child sacrifice. These gods were hungry for blood. They were hungry for sexual promiscuity. So if you were a family person, you would also worship at the temple and share your body with other people. This is the environment that Jonah is being called into the Assyrians would capture people, and they would split up families and divide them up and make them slaves. They, would, they were a terrible, terrible people when you look at them on the surface. And so when God says to Jonah in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 2, get up, God said to Jonah, go to that city, preach against Nineveh because its wickedness has come up to me. In other words, preach the gospel to this city so they repent. Jonah says, no thank you. And you know the rest of the story. He heads 2,000 miles in the opposite direction and boards a boat to get away from the call that God has called him to. Because, why? God, that's not fair that you're calling this evil city to repentance and that you're calling me to do this difficult work. Well, you know what happened. God wasn't fair to Jonah, that disobedient, bratty prophet. That wouldn't listen. Because God should have let him drown. That would have been fair when he was on the boat and the storm came up and Jonah said, I'm the one that, that caused this and I was supposed to go to Nineveh, but I'm here instead. And, 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 and it came to an agreement on the boat that he would be thrown overboard and that should have been the end of Jonah's life right there. But God is the God of patient grace and instead of letting that bratty, disobedient prophet drown, he delivered him in one of the most unlikely ways. And for three days and three nights, you can read it in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah prays to God, beautiful prayer about the patient grace that God showed him. And he didn't let him die like he should have. And after that time in the belly of the fish, God delivered him onto dry ground. And filling his lungs with fresh air, having his feet on dry ground, having his computer up to date, he set forth to Nineveh. And that's where this reading picks up. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. I don't know about you, but I don't like telling bad news to anybody. And that's why when I come home on a Friday night after picking up Papa Murphy's, my hands are sweaty because I walk in the doors and I have forgotten the dessert pizza. And I'm going to have to announce that to my children and to my family. I don't like delivering bad news about anything, let alone going to an unrepentant city whose streets are running with blood and telling them to repent of their sins. Are you kidding me, God? This is so unfair. This is unfair. Look at your own, your own people, the people of Israel. They're starting to worship these same idols that, are, that the Ninevites have introduced to them. Shouldn't we save them? Shouldn't we rescue them? But you want me to go to this people. God, you should bring in the bulldozer and do away with them for good. 
But look at the God of patient grace that takes that attitude and still delivers his prophet. And you see God's grace in the words in front of you, in those simple words, a second time. And in fact, if you finish reading the book of Jonah, you're going to have to learn there would be like a third time and a fourth time probably to get it through to this prophet. You and I have the advantage of looking, uh, we have the advantage of looking at Jonah's life from our perspective and shaking our heads and thinking, what a disobedient evangelist. What a self-centered, bigoted person. But here's the deal. He, he's had his story written down for billions of people to read. You and I, if he would look at our story, maybe he would be shaking his head at us too. A long time ago, I was in a church in a leadership meeting where the pastor was trying to get his leaders to think about outreach to a community around the church. It was like a sub-community that they were talking about reaching out to. And as the conversation went along, I'll never forget, one man spoke up and he said, but, but pastor, if we reach out to that group, they won't contribute, if you know what I mean. The pastor said, no, I don't know what you mean. He said, financially, they'll come in, but they won't give like the rest of the church gives. Ouch. He said the quiet part out loud, didn't he? But he wasn't the only one in the room thinking that. Because that thought had crossed my mind too. Is God's grace, is his forgiveness, is the message of the gospel a commodity that we bring out into the world and we expect the world to give back or... If I'm such a great volunteer at church and I've given hours and hours and hours of volunteer time and, and I've even given a large part of my, my, my income to, to my church and then I look out at other people and I look at them and say, are they deserving of the grace of God? Am I any better than Jonah? Well, God should bring in the bulldozer, shouldn't he? But not on those people and not on Nineveh, but on Dan. Because God is so unfair that he would take that attitude and that he would forgive it and that he would give Dan a second time and a third time and a fourth time because your Lord is the Lord of patient grace. How can that be, Pastor, that God would put up with somebody like you? <laughs> Or how would that be, God? And we live in an age of instant justice. If ever before, in my life at least, we live in a cancel culture or you, you say something or you do something and there needs to be instant justice. And this is why God's patient grace can become so unpopular in our world because he is patient. And he deals with sinners in ways that they shouldn't be dealt with. And he deals with the Jonah inside of me in ways that I shouldn't be dealt with. But pastor, how can that be? God is, is patient, and yet God needs to be just. Wouldn't that be truly terrible if God just let the Ninevites live as Ninevites, and he let these church bigots live as church bigots, and he's patient with them all? How can his grace, and how can his justice, how, how do those two work together? Shouldn't his patience cancel out his justice, and shouldn't his justice cancel out his grace? How does that work? Moses once asked God about himself. He asked him, God, what is your name? And what did God say? The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. How does that work? That God. The answer is, after the prophet Jonah, 800 years later, there was another prophet who, when he came, people heard him speak, and they said, this prophet is unlike all the other prophets. In fact, the closest one we can compare him to is Elijah. And when this prophet speaks, people listened. And I mean, they really listened. And they were either 
They either worshipped him as, as, as God or they rejected him completely because his message was so clear. When he spoke and you walked away from his sermon, there was no doubt in your mind that he knew exactly what God's will was, what God's law was. And he gave the law, in fact, if you read his words, he gave the law even better than Moses did. But at the same time, this prophet that came after Jonah, he never balked when God called him to go and to cross into places like Samaria and to sit at the tables of people that he shouldn't have been sitting with due to the culture and the time and his standing. And he sat at the tables of sinners, he ate with them, and he preached the kingdom of God in pure forgiveness for their sins. And when he did that, he called people from death to life. And he not only preached repentance and forgiveness, here's the thing about this prophet, he was and he is forgiveness and repentance because he gave his life on the cross. And even when a Gentile looked at him and said, this is the Son of God, because he is, he's your Savior. And God's wrath came down at him so that all of God's justice that you and I deserve, that is so unfair, it was unfair, came down on him on the cross and God's love and his grace was given to all people. So you and I are forgiven. The Jonah inside of us, forgiven. What will that do? What do we do with this? This, this new life that we have because, because Jesus is our Savior, because he is the prophet that is more than a prophet, but he's our Lord of patient grace. We take his love into far places that even we as sinners might say, there's no way I can do that and there's no way they deserve that. Remember, the bulldozer was brought in on Jesus instead of you and me, and Jesus then sends you and me out into the world as a sinner going to other people. Jesus said this, you know, he doesn't often drop names of prophets in the Old Testament, but one of them that he does is, is Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12, he says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The people of Nineveh repented. Listen to this. Verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring the destruction he had threatened on them. You know, the commentators will note about this verse that the only prophecy in this entire book that's called a prophetic book because it's, 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 it's in the Bible in the part where the prophets are, the only verse about prophecy is that verse 4. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. O darbaim yom vin Nineveh napakit. That's how it sounds in the original language. And we might look at that and say, that's terrible. Look at that. He's condemning Nineveh as he goes around and he preaches. And this might be a summary of his sermon, or it might be all the words that he spoke. Either way, you get the message. But inside of that verse, did you see God's grace? You see his patient grace. It's three words at the very beginning. 40 more days. God is extending a time of grace to this people that have been rebellious against him. And he's giving them 40 days to think about the forgiveness that God is offering them. And he's not destroying them just right then and right there. It's not the 21st century instant justice that we come to expect. It's called the time of grace. And God gives you and me a time of grace here on this earth too. It's not 40 days. It's, for many people, it's more than 40 days. It's 40 years or maybe double that, plus 10 for some. And God gives the community around us, whoever they are, wherever they've come from, whatever they've done, the same time of grace so that we have to go to them and say, God's grace is extended to you as well. 
Repent and believe. I'm a sinner. I'm a Jonah. I'm, I've, I, 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 God's been unfair to me, and I'm telling you, my friend, God is, God's grace is unfair to you too. He doesn't treat you as your sins deserve, as you think your sins deserve, but he's forgiving you. Um, we only have a certain amount of time here on this, this earth, and uh, as, as we go out into the world, I, I like to think about this as, as I'm doing outreach with Tell, as, as I'm reaching out to people that I have no idea who they are, and some of them have real stories. I mean, they have, they have deep things that they're sharing with you online even. Addictions to a substance, addictions to screens, addictions to sin, like the rest of us. And as you go out, I like to think about this. Have you ever maybe said to your friend on a Friday that's not frozen, <laughs> on a nice weekend, you say to your friend or you say to maybe your roommate or you say to your spouse, let's say even, uh, yeah, your husband or your wife, you say, what do you want to do this weekend? And they say, I want to do whatever you want to do. Now, women, if that's your answer, that's like one of the most frustrating, frustrating answers for a guy because it gets us absolutely nowhere. But when you say, I want to do what you want to do, when it's really meant mindfully, it's actually a very nice thing to say. What that's, what that's saying is this, is I don't care where we go or what we do, I just want to be with you. I want to be with you. And, you know, it's, I don't even care if it's what I like to do. In fact, I want this weekend, I want to do something that you want to do because I'm going to enjoy watching you do it. And when I watch you do it, I'm going to get more enjoyment out of doing whatever I wanted to do. I want to do what you want to do. So when we've been called by God and we've been forgiven by him and he's treated us unfairly and he's brought us into his family as his child, as his son and as his daughter, we say the same thing too. We say, I want what you want. I want what you want. Honey, do you want to, do you want to go, I don't know, out to the winery this weekend? Uh, I, no, I don't want to. What do you want to do? I, I want to go axe throwing and drink craft beer. Okay, well, maybe we'll do it in that order, but I'll do what you want to do this weekend because I love you. God, what do you want? I want what you want. You want me to stand on my head and blow bubbles? You want me to go down to Zilker Park and go up into a tree and sing through the whole hymnal to the world? What do you want me to do, God? God answers. 1 Timothy 2, 3. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what I want, God says. What do you want, Jesus? I want what you want. You're not so much into me standing on my head and blowing bubbles. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Nineveh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Corinth, London, Hong Kong, and, uh, Watertown, New York, Ames, Iowa, Austin, Texas, Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I don't know, God. Austin, it's looking more and more like Nineveh every day. Pretty scary out there. Did you hear what I told you? Surely I am with you always, always, wherever you go, whoever you talk to, whatever their response is, it's me that's sending you. It's me who's with you. God, I don't know if I have the words. Are you sure I have the right words? Oh, Baptizing and teaching them your word, not my word. God, this is so unfair, and I love it, that you redeemed me and made me your child. 
By your patient grace, you forgive me each and every day. By your patient grace, you send me to the farthest places and I feel like my next door neighbor is miles away from me. (laughs) But you send me there. With your word. I'm privileged to bring your message and bring life to this world that you loved by giving your life on the cross. Amen. Let's stand now and confess our faith that we take into the far corners of the world in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Speak it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, uh, you may be seated, and we will continue with the prayers. Prayers, that's right. I'm just relying on the screen here. (laughs) Thank you, Pastor Dan, for your your, uh, very encouraging message this morning. We're going to continue with our prayers of the church. We'll follow that with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's uh, Prayer should be up on the screen for you if you need it. A couple things we'll be praying for this morning. Um, uh, Kristen and Brian Ratliff, uh, Kristen had their baby, Ruth, on Friday, so we rejoice about that. We'll thank God for uh, keeping mother and baby safe. Um, Also be praying for Carol Ridge. Some of you know her. Um, She lives in the conservatory over here in uh, kind of in uh, East or West Pflugerville. She, uh, She came down with COVID about a week ago, and she's in ICU. She's uh, also have pneumo- has pneumonia. Um, she seems to be stable, but obviously that's a tough place. So we're going to be praying for her. And then finally, um, just in the theme of uh, Pastor Dan's message and our worship this morning, we'll be praying that uh, God would help us take the gospel message out into the world. Today we're going to specifically be praying for the people in China. Um, we got a request that we would pray for them and for the work that's being done over there. So please stand and uh, let us bring our prayers to God. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have brought us to another season of Lent. Teach us to fix our eyes on Jesus this season and his innocent suffering and death for our forgiveness. By your grace and mercy, strengthen us to remain faithful in all circumstances of trial temptation, and persecution. Preserve us to the end that we may die believing in your beloved Son and be welcomed into eternal life with you. Lord Jesus, Redeemer of all souls, we know that you are the God of patient grace and far-reaching forgiveness. We marvel at your love and compassion for the lost. We also marvel that your grace can turn hardened hearts from sin to trust in you for salvation. Today we pray for our loved ones, our family members, and all who don't know you or trust in you as their Savior. Lord, send gospel proclaimers, send us into their lives that they may hear the message of Christ and believe. Empower us to boldly proclaim the love and truth of Jesus when we're given the opportunity. We especially remember those who live in China facing government restrictions on religious freedoms Through the ministries connected to our own synod as well as other Christian ministries, continue to bless the spread of the gospel in China so that millions more may be certain of heaven through Christ Jesus. Strengthen the faith of of Chinese Christians by your word so that they are confident in your promises and blessings and that they are bold to share the message of your grace with others. Gracious God, we thank you for watching over our members and the people of Texas during this past week. We know that it is according to your unbounded mercy that you bring us challenges. We know that you use challenges to draw more people closer to you 
to strengthen our trust in your word and promises and to even provide opportunities for us and others to help people who are in need. Thanks for working through the hearts of many around us to come to the aid of others to provide shelter, food, and warmth. Continue to work through our state and our local leaders to restore utilities and provide for those who are still in need and move all of us to care for others through deeds of kindness and grace. Lord of all things, thank you for the birth of a daughter, Ruth, to Brian and Kristen Ratliff this week. Thank you for keeping mother and baby safe through the labor and delivery. For the gift of life and for the gift of baptism that Ruth experienced this week, we give you all of the glory and honor. Great healer and comforter, we lift up to you those in our church and all people who are suffering from sickness or disease or chronic pain. Today we remember Carol Ridge who is in ICU in the hospital with COVID and pneumonia. Lord, we know that no healing is too hard for you. So if it be your will, deliver Carol and deliver all who endure suffering. Give them hearts full of peace, hope, and understanding as you work your purposes and plans in their lives. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve our Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you his peace. Amen. (laughs) You may be seated uh, for our closing song. Thanks again for being with us today. Uh, It's a pleasure to bring you God's word and uh, we hope you were encouraged. Please stick around for Bible study this morning. Um, uh, Pastor Patterson is going to be leading us in a study. I think it's called Lessons Learned from the Snow Cage. Uh, I know he grabbed some input from maybe some of you this uh, the other day and he's just going to be talking about you know what we can learn how we can grow from this last week that we went through. I'm sure it'll be really encouraging. 
Uh, if you would like to give an offering, we have baskets in the back. Uh, also, you can give online. The information is up on the screen. Go to holyword.net. You'll see the information there. I think we just have a couple of other announcements. If you could go to the next slide, Lauren. Uh, is there another one in there? Maybe not. Okay, I'm going to tell it to you real quick. So, weekly, uh, midweek Lent services, we will have those this week, God willing. If we don't have any more weather coming through or other things. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is our midweek Lent service. Also at 10 a.m. for the seniors. Uh, we safe distance, social practice just like we are today. So check those out. And then one last one is uh, maybe Joel, just the Hope and Healing Recovery Ministry. Joel, we have one that we've been doing for a while on Sundays at 4 o'clock. Cynthia Scoggins leads that. And then Joel is also leading a new one every other Saturday, right? At 2 and 4, uh, you can join that through Zoom or you can join them here in the fellowship hall. So uh, on the heels of the, ser the series we just had, consider that as well. Hope and healing. If you've got more questions about it, you can ask Joel. Otherwise, uh, God bless you this week. Thanks again, Dan, for your message. Good to have you back in the pulpit a little bit today. Yeah, good to have you. Um, again, God bless your week.